um, been juggling a lot. So that is the best I could do for this. But no, let's just we're gonna get it over with. So um, share my screen. The last chapter is on two-dimensional problems. Um, so some learning objectives are, well, everything in this chapter can be expressed as a matrix. Um, when you grid in the two dimensions, if it's a rectangle, then it can form a matrix. So we need to define functions on this um, rectangular grid. And then the main theme I've been taking away from this book is to make everything a linear system. <laughs> so uh, in order to do that, we introduce some reshaping functions, VEC and UNVEC, which, um, which are pretty common uh, to transform into linear systems. Talk about Poisson uh, and the Laplace and the special case of Poisson equations. Wait, the special case? No, anyway. Uh, and then there's one last section I forgot to put a learning objective on here, but essentially nonlinear systems. Okay. So first section, tensor product discretization. It's pretty straightforward. We have now two dimensions of space. We also have time, right? So we really kind of have like a, when we get to the um, PDEs, uh, it's a more than just space. We also have time. But anyway, we're just talking about space right now. Um, if we have a rectangular boundaries, um, we take the same approach we've taken in the one dimensional where we grid, right? So X has to a boundary defined by a min and a max and Y has a boundary. And then we, we just take every pair of X, I and Y, J on this grid. Okay. Then we just say, Functions on the grid are a matrix with elements F of X, I, Y, J. Pretty straightforward. So here's an example. Uh, if we have four, right, um, cut point, or we have M is four in the X direction, N is two in the Y, right? So remember that this gives us five and three points because we start from zero. We have f of x is cosine function, uh, some transformation of x and y. Then a matrix, a function on the grid is this matrix here, right? So it's just a matrix where every element is the function evaluated at every grid point. Pretty straightforward. We introduce here plotly js, and the authors say this is for better 3D rendering. If you do this, um, in the terminal, you can actually move around the 3D plot here. It's static. Um, okay. Now we're going to make the grid finer. I think maybe I was supposed to print this F and look at it, but whatever, it's fine. <laughs> okay. This is, um, now one way you can visualize the three dimensions, right? So we have X, Y, and then F of X, Y is sort of the Z. So one way, right, is to sort of color and have this contour plot to see that third dimension, that F function. Um, and then the second way is to do a surface or a 3D plot. So we have the blue is the peaks and the red is the valleys. And this is that cosine pi X, Y, and minus Y. All right. Pretty kosher definition of function on a grid, I would say. Okay. And then the last part of this section just talks about, um, well, what if we don't have a rectangle, you might be able to transform the non-rectangle space to a rectangular space, for example, polar coordinates, right? So if X and Y are defined by a circle, well, then we can transform to polar coordinates and it will be defined on a grid. Okay, so if we have a radius um, on the grid from zero to one and theta on the grid from zero to two pi, we can find this function f where in the polar coordinates, 
um, here's F. And right, it's defined everywhere on this rectangle, 0 to 1, 0 to 2 pi, we'll have it all filled in. And then when we do the transformation to the X and Y, the Euclidean space, I will call it, um, then it's sort of this circle on a disk. Um, I didn't include, there's another example in this section um, on a sphere. And then the last part is, okay, so we defined functions on a grid. How do we define partial derivatives? So the partial derivatives for co-location, so we're using the same strategy we used in chapter 10, where um, we do finite differencing at the grid points, right? So our unknown partial derivative of u with respect to x is the finite difference matrix times this is the matrix representation of the function u on the grid. They go in between this notation and the capital U boldface notation. U, right, is sort of our differential equation that we're working with. Um, and then they just it just says, okay, so co-location, this differencing is across the rows. So uh, we have X along the rows. And so when we want to do finite differencing with Y varying, right? So this is keeping Y fixed, we're finite differencing X. Now this is keeping X fixed, we're finite differencing Y. So we have this transpose here. Um, and anyway. Pretty kosher, like I said. Uh, and then I tried to do some exercises, I think. <laughs> this one was okay. Um, so exercises in this section one, two, and three, they introduce three equations and they first, they go through first plot the function, then plot the partial derivatives. I'll just show you what I got. So this is the function. 2y plus e to the x minus y on this rectangle from 0 to 2 and minus 1 to 1. All right, so define my function, define my matrix of my function, I change the bounds. And the side by side thing, I figured it out, although it did take me a little while. Um, you can use this layout in the first function call. When you're printing to R markdown, you want to do the semicolon, otherwise, it will print the, the intermediate plot. And then, right, we use the bang and we can specify the subplot um, argument in surface. So this is what I have for the function. So this is the contour. This is the 3D. This one seemed okay to me. Um, it's an exponential, right? So pretty flat in some areas and then rapid changes in others. Okay. And then the two plus y makes it not symmetric. The next exercise, say, make side-by-side -side surface plots of the um, partial derivatives, f with respect to x, f with respect to y, using Chebyshev spectral differentiation matrix matrices. So I got the differenti differentiation matrices using the diff Cheb. We've seen this before. Just copied the surface. This one, I am just going to believe. Um, so this is what I took from that definition, right? So it's finite difference times the matrix. Um, and then you have to transpose for plotting because um, the matrix has the X changing sort of vertically and the Y changing horizontally. So to plot it, you do the transpose so that the vertical is the Y and the horizontal is the X. And then for Y, right, it's the function matrix times on the right, the transpose of the Y different finite difference matrix. Um, I was a, I mean, I guess I could probably calculate the true derivative, but these sort of, you can't see the um, legends here, but it kind of explodes <laughs> in these corners. So I'm just gonna trust it. 
for now. Um, and then the last one was make a contour plot of the mixed derivative f x y. And I just assumed that meant, right, we have the finite difference in the x direction and then the y. And this is sort of what it looks like. Um, so this is sort of a peak, second derivative. Yeah, I don't know. I think because these, let's see, minus one. Changing the fastest. I don't know. I didn't like double check if these were right. Anyway, you guys have any objection to this? <laughs> no, I, mean, I think it's hard to, to intuitively pull it out of the blocks, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I put some limits here because uh, it, it drops off really fast. Um, at least the first time I did it, it was, like the scale was like negative. I don't know if um, there's like a, if it approximates negative infinity anywhere, but it was it like dropped off so fast. That's, so I put some limits um, here. Okay. All right. So that's the first section, just kind of, again, introducing the notation and um, those sorts of things. So let's get into then the problem. So two-dimensional diffusion and advection. In general, we have a problem statement like this. So as I mentioned, we have time. So the derivative in time is some function of the state, the partial derivatives, second partial derivatives, and the mixed derivatives. And we're assuming on a rectangle. And we're also making other assumptions in this book, periodic conditions um, and or Dirichlet or sorry, or Dirichlet boundary conditions. And again, the goal is to express this um, two-dimensional problem as an initial value problem to be solved with Runge-Kutta. And the solution, I said in the learning objectives, it's a reshape. So we're gonna vectorize the matrix to give us a linear system. So let's look at the first case, periodic end condition. Periodic end conditions, we vectorize the initial condition and then we can use our friend from before ODE problem. So the example from the book is the heat equation. Um, I didn't write it down, although I believe it's down here, yeah, okay. So we get our grid over X and Y. This time we're using um, this differentiation matrix. I don't remember what PER stands for. Periodic boundary conditions. Oh, periodic, yeah, there we go. Okay, so diff periodic. Um, this is a function, so they're just making a, a function called mtx, and then unvec. Right, so that, that makes a matrix out of f, right, that we need? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you give the argument f, and then it will give you the matrix, yeah. Um, vec is already a function in Julia, but unvec is not, so they do it through this reshaping. Um, all right. So this basically Z is a vector and it's going to make it an M by N matrix. Okay, so the initial conditions is this periodic function. And then we make it a matrix. And then this is just something for scaling. Okay, and then, so here's the, at time zero, this is the initial condition of the states, X to Y. Um, and so, yeah, it's periodic in space. Yes, okay. This is like all new stuff. So I, I'm like on the fly, making sure I say, <laughs> if I say something wrong, I know Ron will have my back. All right, so here's the heat equation. Um, so this is the, derivative u in time. Um, here you can see we're un 
vectorizing a vector into a matrix. Um, so the second derivative in the x direction, right, we have the finite differencing approximation for both of these here. And then this is a heat equation. So um, the change in time of the state is some linear combination of the these two second partial derivatives. And alpha is a parameter that you that you pick. Okay, and then we return right the vectorized um, derivative du dt. Okay, so this is uh, returning a vector, so we can use this initial value problem setup. We have our ODE problem. We pass our function. We vectorize our initial condition. This is our time. So we are um, solving from time equals 0 to time equals 0.2. And then this is our alpha that we're providing 0.1. They say this is a, I can't remember, stiff, not stiff. I don't remember, but they say um, we can use this solver to solve. I guess this, I should change this. This is just the initial condition again, but I just took this so I didn't have an animation in my R markdown, <laughs> um, but you can make an animation. Uh, you can plot the surface. This is the solution. Um, let me just show the, the animation. Okay, here it is. So the, I don't know the physical interpretation of this, but I guess heat over time, it's dissipated, it's mixing, so it's equal. I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's just diffusing out, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so that's for the periodic initial conditions. The Dirichlet, Dirichlet conditions, um, we need to put in the boundary conditions in the corresponding rows and columns. So think about in the other chapter, this says 11, I don't remember if that's right, but in the previous chapter where we had a vector already when we were co-locating and we just replaced the first entry and the last entry to equal exactly the boundary condition, this is the same concept except the boundary condition now corresponds to entire rows and columns. Um, so they go through a bunch of definitions of, um, you know, the E unit vectors that select out the rows and columns to sort of delete them and add them back in and, and et cetera. And they do that by defining these pack and unpack columns. Uh, and then they extend the boundary values by they extend the matrix so that and the boundary values are zero. Um, I don't think it's necessary. Well, the code will show a little bit more what what I mean. So here's an example. Okay, um, it's zero on the boundary. All right. Um, so okay, again, the setup here. We have. Um, the initial condition, so in time, and then these are the matrices I was mentioning. So we have these EX and EY. These are matrices that you pre and post multiply by to um, get the interior of the grid and the boundary. All right, so we have this, again, an unvec function. Okay, so PAC. PAC is a function that takes a matrix and vectorizes this sort of, as I mentioned, this takes the interior of this matrix. And then unpack uh, the opposite, or it undo, undoes that. All right, so here is our function. So right, so we're unpacking this vector W to get the matrix. And then let's see. All this we introduce some packing. Okay. 
And then again, here we go. Same solution is to use the ODE problem. Um, solving, we unpack, we have some plots here. So this is advection and diffusion. So this is the surface plot and this is the contour plot with a different color scheme, the viridis color. So this is the colorblind friendly color palette. Um, yeah. Let's see. Did I miss anything? No, I think that's basically just of that. And then I was gonna just show the wave equation in here. There's one more demo on the wave equation. Okay, so we have this two dimensional wave equation. Now we have pair of matrices, right? So this wave equation is the second partial derivative with time. So just like our trick we saw before, um, we have u and now we have v, which is the first derivative. Okay. Um, let's see. So yeah, so now we're packing the pair of matrices U and V together. So you can see we're stacking them. Um, v doesn't have the boundary condition, so we don't have to do the pre and post multiplication by these selector matrices, these E's. Okay. Um, and yeah, again, so we're linear, linear stacking it. <laughs> I can't say in your eyes right now. Stacking these two, right? So that this becomes um, the the unknown vector or the thing we're trying to solve. Or, I don't know. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Okay, let's see the animation. Oh, it's getting cut off, but it's kind of cool, this wave. Oh, here we go. Make it bigger. Hmm. And it hits the boundary and goes back into the middle. All right. So to be honest with you, I tried some equation or some exercises and I uh I got I got stuck. So I'll just show what I did and we can either try to talk through it, work through it, uh, whatever. So this is another form of the wave equation. Maxwell's equation, we can find a way to convert the wave equation to a first order form that uses only first order derivatives in space, right? So this is the um, first partial derivative. And then we just define V and W subject to u equals zero on the boundary. Okay, so I think, so it says show that a solution satisfies ut equals c squared ux plus uyy. So- Wait, Are you sure it's not utt? I know, I think it was, maybe it's a typo. Yeah, it must be a typo. Maybe the way I it had a typo. UTT. Okay, which one was it? Okay. Thank yeah, you. it's a typo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because I was that's like, not the wave equation. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, then there we go. Then we solve that problem. So yeah. So you just take the partial derivative with respect to uh, y here, or like a second partial derivative, and a second partial derivative here with x, and then yeah. Okay. If this says utt, then that just means we can take the second partial derivative of this equation with respect to time and then plug these in and then we'll get the answer. Okay, great. <laughs> um, and then, so yeah, that was my now what? All right, but we solved that. Okay, great. So solve with C equals two in the rectangle minus three to three. Um, this is our initial, um, a condition v equals 
w equals zero. Okay, so I think what I need to do, um, so I think if we were to solve this, so I started following um, the code I just showed on the wave equation, but I guess I need another, I need a w matrix too. So here, I would have V and, and W. Okay. All right, well. Um, okay, that's as far as I got on that exercise. <laughs> I gave up. Um, all right. Okay, so next is these Laplace and Poisson equations. Um, the Poisson equation in two dimensions says, has this form. So the um, second partial derivative with x plus second partial derivative in y equals some function of x and y. This here is sometimes expressed with this notation, delta u, where delta is the Laplacian operator. Or uh, it's sometimes called the forcing function, f. If f is zero everywhere constant, then that's the Laplace equation. All right, so this defines an elliptic PDE. So we've talked about parabolic and hyperparabolic. Now this is elliptic. No time appears in this equation, so it often represents a steady state solution. We must complement with a boundary condition, and in this book, we only consider um, in this form u of xy equals g of xy. All right. So we're going to go back to our friends there derivative matrices, and this is called the Sylvester equation. So when we discretize the Poisson equation with these matrices, that, that's just the name. I don't know who Sylvester is, but um, we need to now introduce the Kronecker product. So this is just probably where we're familiar with this, but this is just a little demo. So we have A is the, this matrix. B is this matrix. The Kronecker product um, matches up like this. So you have A11 times all of B. So essentially for every element in A, you multiply it by the entire matrix B and you sort of concatenate things in this way. So we will get um, right a four by six matrix. Okay, but you don't have to write, type this out. You can use the built-in function cron. Or I don't know if it's built-in, but it's in our books package at least, cron. Okay, so why do we need this chronicle product? Well, we need it so that we can linearize um, our Sylvester equation. When we do the matrix math with the vectorization, the way we can express our matrix A is through Kronecker products. So we have, we essentially, right, we need to repeat this matrix in the dimension of Y, and we need to repeat uh, this matrix in the dimension of X. And then we have the vectorized U will give us this long vector and vectorized F. And then we have A U equals B. And we can solve that. <laughs> Uh, and then again, right, you can go in here and modify B and A such that the boundary conditions are at their precise values, like we saw in the co-location. So the template for solving a Poisson, equa Poisson equation, yeah. Create the linear system, so that's what we have here. Modify it for the boundary conditions, like we saw in co-location. Solve it using backslash and then reshape to get it back on the grid. 
the condition number of this method is improved um, if you rescale by the largest of linear coefficients, uh, the boundary conditions. I believe, let me just double check actually. It's just like a small little detail that probably we don't need to worry about, but yeah, right here. So the boundary condition is rescaled by the largest coefficient in A. Okay. Okay, so let's look at how they coded this. So they have this function, Poisson, finite difference. I'm guessing that's what FD means. Oh yeah, finite differences. So this is the template. Discretize the domain, form the collated PDE as a linear system, identify boundary conditions. Is boundary is they're so using some logic. Apply the Dirichlet conditions, and then solve with the backslash, and then reshape it back to the grid. All right. Okay. So here's an example. We have uh, f is a function x squared minus y plus 2. So this is our forcing function. Here is the matrix. All right. When we form our system A with the Kronecker products. We form B, vectorize F. Uh, did it show the length? No. Okay. So this is what A looks like before we add the boundary condition. So you can see it's sparse, right? Um, because we're doing finite differencing. So most of the values are zero because finite differencing, remember, it's only like a local, local estimator. Okay, then we need to add in the boundary conditions. So now we have, um, this are the boundary points. This is just showing them on the grid. All right, and here's our Dirichlet conditions. And I didn't, couldn't figure out, this is a Julia note. When I use this dot equal and I use a semicolon, it doesn't suppress. The output. I, I don't know why. Um, so this is just this diagonal matrix here. Um, or sparse matrix. All right. So now with the boundary conditions, um, right, so here on the boundary, we no longer have those coefficients. It's just exactly equal to whatever it's supposed to be equal to in the boundary. And then that goes all the way down. So this is probably, these correspond to how many boundary points we have on the X and Y um, space. And then, then when we get start getting to here, these are all the interior. Uh, and looks like it's not exactly in the right order. So we have some more boundary points in here. All right. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, the boundary is zero in this case. This is what we're saying here. Again, see, it's not suppressing the output. I don't, I have no idea why. And we solve with backslash and we get this. Um, all right. So this is the matrix U of our solution. Well, let's talk about accuracy and efficiency. We know a little bit about this from before, right? We know that if we have a finer grid, we can get a little bit more accurate, but our efficiency um, in terms of computation really goes down. So A has size n squared um, and the number of operations to compute the sparse Cholesky is n cubed. This is assuming square grid. So M equals N. This is what I was just saying. As n increases, we have lower truncation error, but we have more operations. For fixed runtime t, the convergence is on the order of 1 over the square root of t, where 
the size n is on the order t to the quarter to the one fourth. So um, it said something like, if you increase your grid by 10, you increase your computation by 100. That's sort of the scaling for finite differencing because it's sparse. When you have dense Chebyshev spectral discretization, but, um, it's more like this. And they didn't give an interpretation. And I'm not going to try to interpret this, but essentially K is some fixed number. And now we have K to the minus N, which is on the order of um, minus T to the one sixth now. Okay. Let's see, I did not do any exercise in this section. <laughs> so those are the linear, the two linear cases. Um, well, I guess section two was the linear um, in time and then three was steady state. The last one to wrap up the book, nonlinear elliptic PDs. PDs. Um, so, I mean, now we have, in generally, we have this function equal to zero phi on the interior. Okay, and then we have some boundary conditions for on the boundary of x and y. The core idea is what we already saw before. Formulate co-location equations at grid points based on um, discrete approximations and solve. That gives us a set of nonlinear equations that we need to solve by quasi-Newton method. Okay, so this says I want to read the elliptic function. All right, so solve the elliptic PDE on the rectangle subject to, here we have a specific that the um, boundary condition is zero. Okay, so it looks similar to what we just saw the Poisson LD except now, right, we, or Poisson FD except now we have, right, Levenberg for the nonlinear. Uh, approximation. And we are calculating the PDE here with its Jacobian and the boundary conditions. Let's see, GB. Okay. All right. Okay. And then this, um, I have some comments about this, but this is just saying we can do some polynomial interpolation to evaluate the PDE outside of the boundary. Okay, so off-grid or off-grid evaluation, sorry, not outside the boundary. <laughs> it's only defined on the boundary, off the grid. So off-grid evaluation done by global polynomial interpolation, similar to, um, the co-location where first you assume like y is fixed, then x is fixed, it's similar here. So first you can interpolate across x within a given column, uj, to get these v's. Then you can interpolate over y um, to get some function of psi and eta. All right. So if you remember from several chapters ago, we talked about the, this um, system that describes this disc, this micro mechanical deflector where it, the disc will deflect. Okay. And this is now we're just calling that elliptic function I showed. And we have this plot, so deflection of the membrane. And yeah, it looks pretty. <laughs> I don't yeah, know what else yeah. to say about it. Um, this is a different, this isn't the surface function. This is contour, or sorry, not surface. What was the other one? Plot. We were just using plot before, but now this is contour F. I don't know what the difference is, but um, yeah. And we can check um, the accuracy of this function by 
we know at the boundary it should be zero. So we check whether the boundary in our estimation is actually zero. We can look at the infinity norm between our estimate u and ng, and it's uh, numerically zero. We can look at truncation error, error on the interior. Um, and by inspection, this is several digits accurate, maybe four, five, I don't know. Anyway, it's pretty accurate. All right. And I did try to do, no, I think I just wrote it down. <laughs> I just wrote it down. I did try. Actually, I tried it in my Julia here. Um, so this is, if you remember, you maybe don't remember because I was the one that presented it, <laughs> but, um, and let me just go back. When we were talking about shooting method, we had this Allen Kahn equation, uh, equation and the exercise was like, increase this epsilon parameter and see what happens because the numeric, yeah, this one. Right, so we were sort of chain, making epsilon smaller and smaller. Um, and it told us like when it's small, you will get error warning messages. And so my initial attempt at solving this is kind of small. Um, we're, it aborted. So I think I, well, I guess I didn't do the right thing. This isn't even elliptic. It's not the right code, I guess. This must be for um, the other, the previous section, sorry. Oh yeah, no, hold on. Oh, sorry, this was for extra section 13.2. Okay, yeah, so I was using the right function. Um, but yeah, it uh, wanted a small value of epsilon 0 0.001. So I don't know, I probably needed to choose a different solver here. But anyway, I plotted the initial condition. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, that chapter was... Uh, I could follow the text, but the exercises, I, I couldn't really go to the practice part. <laughs> well, you did more than I did. I read it, kind of followed along, hummed along, as they say. And uh, yeah, yeah, I get it. And then I thought some of it was pretty cool. Like, I like the idea of like taking the matrix, take the function as a matrix and pull it apart as a big long vector and mm -hmm. uh, then treat it as, you know, n, you know, n squared. Diff ordinary differential equations, then unpack it or you know repack it, unpack it. All that's kind of neat, but I didn't mm -hmm. do any of the exercises. I'm just like I didn't have any time for that. I I knew they were going to be really hard and the kind of thing yeah. that was going to be valuable for me right now. I tried, but yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, I know this is our last meeting. It was fun reading the book with y'all. Yeah, we did it. So hey, we did it. It was tempting to quit a few times in there. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. We made Cause, it. Because I think our goal, or at least my goal in starting this was, hey, let's, you know, learn some Julia, which I guess the only way to really learn something is, is to do it in anger. But as I say, but I don't know. I didn't feel like there was enough Julia uh, instruction. It's kind of just like, oh, yeah, just we're just going to use Julia. And too bad if you don't. You have to go grasp it on your own, so to speak. So, yeah. yeah, I think I I wanted also to learn Julia, and I think I stuck with the book actually more for the math in that. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm saying yeah <laughs> because of this new project I'm working on in scientific machine learning. So, like, how's that going? It's going. Yeah, I got a student now, and um, nice. Uh. We're doing a lot of reading, or he's he's doing a lot of reading right now for me. But uh, 
we um yeah it's yeah. interesting i think that yeah that whole julia scientific machine learning uh project and the tools that they have available is just awesome <laughs> But yeah. I haven't, I've done, I've done a little bit with the Turing and, uh, you know, doing some ODE stuff with that, which was just for kind of fun, but I ended up going back and doing from an actual project back and doing it in PyMC just because everybody else is using Python. So, mm -hmm. and it's a lot harder in Python because you have to use some special Sun ODE library, which actually Julie uses too, but it does it all nice. Sundial, it does it all nice and easy behind the mm -hmm. scenes. Whereas when you, and you, it's very clear and Julia with in Turing, if you want to have a model, a Bayesian model, statistical model with a differential equation in the middle. You just put it in there, and it all just kind of works. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to go through a lot of hoops. But in Python, you certainly do. So, but mm. it, I'm stuck using Python right now for that. I'd mm. rather be using Julia. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna put it.